uh, very honored to have the opportunity to speak with you today. And I think for the uh, amount of time that I have, what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak first for um, maybe 25 minutes or so, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. But I'd really rather uh, ask, answer a question from you guys or what you're thinking and uh, whatever I can do to, to answer those questions, I, I will do it. Um, I was, I've been trying to figure out how I would uh, address uh, you guys this time, for this time that I have today. And, you know, I vacillated back and forth um, of maybe talking about uh, attitude, talking about uh, integrity, character, those kinds of things. Maybe you've heard of that enough. And I, I, really, I really just kind of wanted to break it down today and just talk about some of the men that have really made a difference in my life and kind of really have helped me to get to this point that I am right now and uh, have really made me, inspired me to come to the place of just being the best that I can be as a coach, even if it meant taking a different turn outside of the game and going and get the knowledge that I needed to come back and be excellent. So for me, I'm gonna start in, in high school. Uh, the gentleman by the name of Coach Oliver Brown. Now, being a young kid from a broken home, Dad left home when I was 12. I'm the last of 10 kids. And um, my brother Grady, who was next to me in the family line, came back home to help my mom uh, raise me and, and my sister. Uh, it was a tough time. And I was trying to figure out my identity. I was trying to figure out who I was, where I was going to go. And at that time, I was kind of running with a group of kids. and. I really needed to change directions, and I, I needed to do a lot of things different. My dad kind of started working with me as a kid, and, and you know, dad can be tough, and, but he didn't finish. When he and my mom divorced, it, it was just kind of, I was just kind of there. And kind of went through middle school and had some bumps and bruises there, and I got to high school. And that's where I met Oliver Brown. When I first met Coach Brown, he looked at me and he said, um, son, you're one of those Singletaries, aren't you? And uh, I said, yes, sir, I am. And you have to understand, in my family, I'm from a Pentecostal family. My father was a Pentecostal pastor. So it was fire and brimstone every Sunday. And um, we were not allowed to play sports. We were really not allowed to look at sports. So all of my brothers who were larger than me, better than me, faster than me, um, they didn't get to play sports. And so here I come, and he looked at me, and he said, okay, another one of those Singletaries. But I told him that I was going to play football. And he walked up to me the first day, and he said, son, I want you to understand something. You come out here to play this game, you gotta have your mind right. You gotta be focused. You gotta be a great student. And you gotta have the character that people can look up to. Now he said all those things and at that time, I didn't really understand what he was talking about. It was really the same things that my mom and dad were talking about, but really just in a different way that I'd ever heard before. So as time went on, I, I just watched him. And of course, he was watching me, and he was tough. I mean, he had a board in practice. You didn't know what you were doing. It was no, OK, son, look here. Now we're going to do it. No, no, no. You got popped on your tail. You had to know where you were going, what you were doing at all times. But the thing about Coach Brown that I noticed more so than anything else is how he cared about the kids there how he cared about the community, how he made a difference in the community. There were kids that would come in and out of his office, and they had issues. And he knew every one of those kids. He knew the kids that didn't play football. It was important to him that he knew about the lives of the kids. 
And today that's something that I'm not really sure that's happening. I'm not really sure that it's happening at the high school level. I'm not really sure that it's happening at the collegiate level. And I know it's not happening at the NFL level, where the coaches are really invested in the kids. And to me, some of the history that I've learned about the game, I remember somebody talking to me about Bear Bryant, and I, I, I love le learning the history of great coaches. And Bear Bryant was one of them, but the thing I heard about Bear Bryant was it, it was important to him, it was all about the kids. It was all about the kids. Whatever is best for the kids, that's the decision that we're gonna make. Now, I don't think that's happening today. Now, that may, that may even mean sending a kid home. That may even mean cutting a kid off the team. It may, do, it may mean doing some really tough things. And in our society today, we are really changing. We are going in a different direction. You know, there was a time where the, the parents led. It was a time that the father was at home. When you look around, there's no father at home. In many cases, not even a mother at home. These kids are raising themselves. But you know what? I look at life like this. I really believe this. I look at a coach just like I look at God. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's not going to change. And as a coach, it does not mean that because times have changed, because the kids have changed. Maybe you figure out a different way of trying to communicate with them, but the values in which you teach the game should not change. Because if they do change, then you are hurting the kid. If you will not stand up and tell this kid what is right, if you will not stand up and what, what you say and, and, and the rules that you have for the kid that's on the bench that does not play, that same rule has to be for the starting player. It has to be for the, the same for the star player. There should be no inconsistencies to me. One of the greatest things I know and remember about Coach Brown was he was a man that was consistent. And to me, the C in coach stands for consistency. I must be the same guy every day. That kid needs to know what to expect from me. I am not going to change. I am not going to change because you came from a broken home. I am not going to change because your dad is incarcerated. I am not going to change because all of your brothers are in jail. I am not going to change. Because your mom was on drugs, I'm not going to change. But what I am going to do, I'm going to reach as far as I can to get you. I'm going to find out all I can about you. I'm going to read books. I'm going to listen to tapes. I'm going to do everything. I am not going to change. But my approach may change. My approach may change. If you know that a kid is going through a really difficult time at home, maybe your approach changes. Maybe you don't come at him the same way. Maybe it changes. But the values in which we play this game, the right and the privilege that you have to play this game, it will not change. I will not damage the game of football. I will not lower the level of football. because of some of the things that have happened in your life. I can't do that. Now, I got to come off. I got to take my hat off as a coach. I got to take my whistle off. And I got to go as far as I can go without, without changing to help that kid. That's the thing that I loved about Coach Brown. Coach Brown was tough every day. And when you saw Coach Brown, I don't care if you were drunk, somehow you got sober. <laughs> and when you walked on that campus, you were a leader. When you went to the classroom, you sat in the front row. When something happened in the school, the football players were the ones that stepped up and made it right. If you were at a party, and there was drugs at that party, you left. 
If there was a fight and it involved a football player, you got him out. You had each other's back, and that's the thing that he taught us. That's the thing that he taught me. The thing that he taught every one of us, I want you to be the best in that classroom. You're just not going to compete on the field, but I want you to compete in that classroom just as hard as you compete in that classroom because when football is over, you got to go out there and you got to compete in that world. And if I have not prepared you for the truth, those people will come up to you out there, they don't like you. They'll cheer for you, but they know that if the girl is there, chances are you're going to get her. They don't like that. Chances are, if there's a break to be had, you're going to get it. They don't like that. And rightfully so. It's just nature. It's just life. But it is our job as coaches, especially at the high school level, for you to reach into that kid and pull it out of him. Those kids have no idea what they can do. They have no idea the power that they have. Many of the kids in our country today are being prostituted. They're just prostitutes. Because the coach is doing everything that he can just to keep him on the field. And that's wrong. I do not want you to play on this team if you cannot live the standard of this team. I am doing you a disservice if I let you play on this team and I know that you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing. I got to get you out of here. I got to wake you up. If you love the game, you will do what it takes to come back. But if I let you go and I act like I don't see it, five years from now, 10 years from now, when that kid is arrested, five years from now, 10 years from now, when that kid is strung out on drugs, five years from now, 10 years from now, when that kid cannot find a job, it's on you. It's on you. The blood is on your hands. Now, I'm telling you this because if Coach Brown had not reached for me, I would not be here. He was the only person in my life, the only man in my life that I really believed and I really trusted. When he told me, son, you can be great. When he told me, son, if you do this, this, and this, you'll get a scholarship to go to college. Because I know you don't have any money to get there. I know your parents, I know your mom doesn't have any money to get you there. But if you will do this, this, and this, you get there. And I trusted him. And I did everything that I could to do this, this, and this, and I got there. That was high school. When I got to college, a gentleman named Corky Nelson, Corky Nelson recruited me. He was the nicest man I thought I'd ever met. He said, son, if you come to Baylor, this is the Christian school. You come to Baylor, we're going to love you. We're going to take care of you. You're going to eat three meals a day. And that, that was really sounded good. I mean, this is going to be fantastic, son. What do you think? <laughs> Sounds like a good deal to me. I got to Baylor, and I'll never forget, first drill, the first practice, first drill, we're going. And that same coach looked over at me, and I, I promise I'd never seen him, heard him in the day of my life. He said some words to me to get me in this drill. Hey, get over here, you blankety blank, blank, blank. I was like, who is he talking to? <laughs> I'm talking to you, get over here. I got in, it was the same from that day to the day I left. I remember my last year at Baylor. He said, son, uh, let's go up here so I can talk to you. I, I didn't like him. I really, I did not like him. Honestly, I did not like him. We went up in the stands and we sat down. I looked one way and he was talking to me, sitting right here. And I was looking with tears in my eyes once again. And he said, son, 
I'm trying to help you. I, I know I'm not the nicest guy you've ever met. But in 20 years, I promise you, you're going to thank me. In 20 years. Not right now. 20 years, you're going to thank me. Because I'm giving you all that I have every day. And I'm telling you, there were times I was on the ground trying to get up. And he is screaming at me to get back up and get over those bags and do it again. Do it to his specification. In many days, it was a long, long day. When I left Baylor, I could not wait to get away from Corky Nelson. Every day was a nightmare. But this man gave me, I did not realize it at the time, what he gave me, the tools that he gave me. This is your responsibility as a coach, to be able to deliver the tools, not a system, but the tools to this kid. Which foot should he step with? Where should his eyes be? Where should his hands be? That is the thing that you got to equip that kid with. If you don't equip that kid with those things, then he cannot pre prepare to be his best. As a coach, I, I'm telling you, I have gone everywhere that I can go, whether I'm sitting down talking to Bill Parcells or whether I'm sitting down talking to a coach in college. I'm trying to find the best coaches that I could find to go find out what is the technique to this particular drill. What is the best technique for this offensive lineman? What is the best technique for this wide receiver? What is the best technique for the quarterback? What is the best technique for the linebacker? Everything that I could do, I put money out of my pocket to go find them. Who is the best at this? So that I can, the next time that I'm doing this, that I can give it to the kid because kids don't mind working hard if they trust you and they know that you're giving them something of value. Corky Nelson gave me something of value. He gave me the tools of my trade. I had no business doing some of the things that I did. As a matter of fact, not long ago, I was at a Starbucks getting coffee for my wife, and there was a gentleman standing over against the wall, and he was staring at me. I don't like it when people stare at me. <laughs> I'm going to get coffee for my wife, and he comes up to me finally, and he says, you don't remember me, do you? No, so I don't. He said, well, when you graduated from high school, I was a guy at small black school in Houston that was trying to convince you that if you went to Baylor, they would never, no one would ever hear about you again. You're just going to be another statistic because you are not big, you are not fast. There was nothing about you that was great. But you looked at me and you said, I am going to Baylor University and I am going to be great. And he said, I walked away from you and I shook my head. And he said, this kid is another kid. I have no idea what he was doing. And you know what? He was right. But when I went to Baylor, I was so hungry. I was so hungry to be great. Coach Brown told me when I left high school, do not come back to this school until you have that paper in your hand, that degree. Don't come back telling me how tough it was in college. Don't tell me how the people didn't like you because of the color of your skin. I don't want to hear any of that crap. I want you to come back in four years and show me the paper. You understand? Yes, sir. So when I go to Baylor, I get my degree. I do the things that I need to do. This guy is standing there telling me, I'm amazed every time I see you on television. I shake my head. I was one of the smallest guys at the collegiate level. I was definitely one of the smallest guys in, at the NFL level. But Corky Nelson gave me the tools to be great. And he made me practice those tools. He made me go back to the dorm and practice those tools. He gave me homework every night. I want to see this foot step over that dummy. Step over that dummy and it's got to be flat when you step over it. And when that one's coming down, the next foot's got to be coming over in the same place. You understand what I'm saying? Your back's got to be flat. You got to be ready to hit. You got to be in football position every moment. You understand? 
Now, as a coach, just about every linebacker I've ever had has been all pro. I would say it's maybe 85, 90%. If coaches said, this guy can't play, this guy's not very smart, this guy can't do this, give him to me. And my thing is, not because I'm great, but because I'm honest. I will tell my players, don't tell me what you can't do. Tell me what you won't do, because that's more of the true statement. Don't tell me what you can't do. Tell me what you won't do. You know, history, history right now will tell you that nobody really, really knows what capable, what the capabilities are of a human being. When you want something bad enough that it hurts, when you want something deep enough where you can't sleep at night, it gets you up in the morning, it wakes you up in the middle of the night, don't tell me that it can't be done. It just depends on how hungry you are. I've had three to four players since I've been coaching to come up to me with tears in their eyes. Coach, I want to be great. How do I be great? How do I be great? The son, it's, it's okay. I, I know that. I know that voice. I know that hunger. And when you get one, man, it's a blessing. Every one of those players that talk to me are going to be in the Hall of Fame one day. And I will not tell you their names. Every one of those players that had the hunger, and as a coach, you have to be able to meet it. You have to be able to meet that hunger. When Corky Nelson gave me those tools, I went home, I did it. I was hitting everything. I was hitting my mom, I was hitting my sisters, I was hitting everything. I was hitting posts, I was hitting everything trying to get my back flat, trying to get my feet right. I was jumping over everything. I was doing, I mean, running in the post, running in the, I mean, it was everything I could find. I was doing it, running in the cars. But I did not call Corky Nelson when I left Baylor. I could not wait to get away from him. So this man is crazy. This man hates all linebackers. It wasn't 20 years, it was 15 years. About 20 years, 15 years later, I was at practice. I was coaching my son, and I was on his tail. He did not want to do it right. And I said, no, you're going to do it right or you're going to quit today. We got in the car to go home. He's looking out of the window with tears in his eyes. I'm talking to him. And it dawned on me, I'd never thought about Corky Nelson before that day. And it dawned on me, I stopped the car, and I pulled over, and I began to cry. I called Corky Nelson. I said, Coach, I want you to know I'm sorry. I want you to know that I know my head was so hard and it was so tough to teach me something because I thought I knew it all. And Coach, I, I just want you to know I can't ever thank you enough for what you did for me. Because of you, you changed my life. Every all pro that I made, all 10 of them, I owe it to him. Going across the stage at the Hall of Fame, walking across that stage, I owe it to him.
because every day he gave me his best. And those kids deserve your best. And that's why you have to demand theirs. Football is a tough game. It is a contact sport. It is a collision sport. If you don't like being hit, get out. But it is up to us as coaches to teach guys how to be in football position. Guys today, the thing that's frustrating for me today is guys are not in football position. I see guys all the time with their heads down. Their eyes are looking at the ground. They're hitting a target that they see a few minutes before they get there and they put their head down, they put their hands out. They have no chance. It's the most vulnerable position in their lives. And as a coach, one of the things that I learned in the seventh grade was how to keep my face up, keep my eyes open, run through what I'm trying to hit. Always moving my feet. Never get out of football position, keeping my head on a swivel. I learned that in the seventh grade. And those techniques in the seventh grade has carried me through to this day. And everywhere I go, people are saying, hey, man, you're walking straight. Hey, you look good. How do you feel? I feel great. Why? Because someone took the time to teach me the tools, the tools of my trade. Gentlemen, I want to tell you it is not the system. And I know today there are a lot of things that are popular. <laughs> Football has become something else now. But it is those coaches that will continue to understand that football is blocking and tackling. Fundamentally sound, back flat, face up, moving your feet, head on a swivel at all times. Hostile, mobile, agile. That's football. That's football. And it will always be football. Every year in the playoff, it's going to be those teams that are fundamentally sound. Whether it's in college, whether it's in the pros, whether it's in high school, whether it's in Pop Warner. If you are consistent and your programs are consistent, you have done everything that you can to get the tools for those kids. Give them the best tools possible. Teach them the game honestly. Demand it honestly. First from yourself, then them. Never change. Only change your approach in how you find a way to reach that kid. Never compromise. The last thing I want to talk about before I, go, I uh, open it up for question and answer is this. As a coach, every time I see a coach, my heart goes out because there is a thin line. There's a thin line when you're chasing excellence. When you're chasing, you want to go to the next job. You want to be at the next level. You want to make more money. You want to get more kids. You want to do this. You want to do that. And there's never enough time. My last year in the league, when I retired, I had a critical decision to make. I remember telling my wife, my wife and I had a conversation before we got married. I said, sweetheart, I'm going to be playing football. Now, you know I got to watch film. You know I got to practice. You know I gotta, I'm not like these other guys. I, I'm, I'm going to be on Tuesdays, our day off. I'm going to be at the office. Now, you know that. Are you okay with that? You know, she, yes. Your wife said the same thing. I'm going to coach. Now, we may move a few times. What's she going to say? Yes, you want to get married. But she had no idea what she was saying. And what do you say? I, we said it. We already said it. Well, you didn't even know. You had no idea. But I want to tell you this. 
The saddest thing that I have seen in the last few years, because I visited a lot of coaches, a lot of great coaches, and I go to their homes, I see trophies, I see plaques, the pictures of the wall of their kids, grandkids, but the coaches are alone. They're retired and they're alone. They don't have a wife, they're divorced, tough to live with. The kids don't know them. And the thing that, to me, when people ask me, what is success to you? Success to me is when I find a way to do what I am called to do. It is my calling to coach. To do what I am called to do without compromising what I must do first. The most important team in my life is my family, my wife, and my kids. When I made it to the Hall of Fame, I asked my wife, and I asked my mom as well, both of you, are going to be the first women to induct a Hall of Famer, to introduce a Hall of Famer. My mom said, I can't do it, son. I'll talk for an hour. <laughs> I accepted. OK. I told my wife, you're not getting out of it. You got to do it. She's the first wife to ever present her husband into the Hall of Fame. Why? because we went through it together. When I got hurt, <laughs> she was the one who had to nurse me at night when I'm crying all night because of, because of an elbow or a knee or whatever. She was the one that was there. She was the one that was there when they were saying that I lost a step and maybe I should retire. She was the one that was there when I felt I should have made more money and they were cheating me. And she talked me into Mike, you know what? Come on now. What do you want to do? Let, let, we're in it together. What's right? Forget about who's making this, who's making that. What is right for us? She was the one always. When I had a kid that was straying off to the right or to the left, she was the one. Mike, you need to talk to your son. You need to talk to our son. You're losing him. Mike, you need to talk to your daughter. Our daughter, we're losing her. Our oldest son, Mike, there's so much pressure on him to be like you. If I am not invested in my home first as a father and as a husband, I don't care how many championships I win. I don't care how high I go as the coach. I don't care how many kids come by my house and say, thank you, coach. If my own kids and my wife cannot look me in the eye and tell me that they love me and tell me that they thank me for being there, finding a way because they know how important football is to you, but you found a way to be there for them and you know it to be true. That's success. That is true success. Don't wait until at the end of it and go, you were right. Do it now. Make the decision in your life now to make sure that the most important team, the most important team is the team that you pay most attention to. And what happens after that is gravy. So with that, I thank you for this part of the session and I will take some questions.
Thank you. If I'm here, you may as well ask the question. Now I'm going to do to my very best to answer. Can you uh, talk to the coaches about the importance of being a great life coach as well as being a great football coach? Oh, wait, wait a minute. Say that. We're treating. I'm sorry. Say that again. If... Can you talk to the coaches about the importance of not only being a great football coach, but also being a great life coach? It's not important just to be a great football coach, but also the importance of, what was the last part? Life. Um, I think, I think that it's so important that that's one of the things as, as a coach that I found is finding a balance of surrounding yourself with coaches that, that really understand that. Because, um, as a coach, a lot of times we want to find the best coach, and it's important that we do that. But at the same time, it's finding those coaches that, that have um, the same values, and it's hard to do. There are some coaches that you can, you can talk, you can try to tell them, you can, but they're just going to go back to being who they are. So I, I think it's up to the coach to really do a great job of looking at the value and the characters of those coaches. So you don't have to talk as much, but you can spend more time talking to your kids and teaching them. Um, I tell you what, man, that's, that's really hard. But one of the things that I, I think is the toughest thing to find, um, it, it is tough to find coaches. Now, this, I, I, I mean, I'm just being very, very honest. It is tough to find coaches that really do care about the kids, really do care about what's best for the kid. Um, and the kids know that. Uh, it, it's, it, it is, it, it's a thin line, man. It's, it's a tough thing to do, but I would just say do the very best that you can as early as you can, as quick as you can to find those coaches that have the same values that you have and um, the less you have to talk about it. Hey, Mike, I want to thank you for your conversation you did uh, a few minutes ago. But what I want you to talk about briefly is everybody gets a trophy. I think in sports period, we become to an organization where we don't want to be honest with the kids, but then we want to make them think that everybody is the same and everybody gets the same trophy when there's no hard work and dedication. And as you see, if you don't put any hard work and dedication in what you want, you can't achieve the goals you want. Well, <clears throat> you know, it, it, uh, when I think back on, on uh, my life, you know, there, there was a time, like my coach that I had in college, Corky Nelson, Coach Brown, a lot of people would say those guys are extinct. You know, they, um, but they told you the truth. And it, it's really sad that coaches today feel that, you know, because of the pressure of winning, um, <laughs> you just go out and find the best athletes you can and put them together. You don't have time to teach fundamentals. You don't have time to teach, you know, the ABCs of the game. So I'm just going to get the best athlete, put them out there, and throw them in a the system and say, let's go. And, and to me, uh, I, I get that. I, I get that. But I, I just think that... Um, I, 
I just think that it's so important that uh, you really take a step back and really take the time to, to try and develop the kid and, and have them understand that, that this, is, this is the way we're going to go, this is how we're going to do it, and this is how we're going to get there. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a hard, that, that, that's, a, that's a hard, that's tough. That's a tough one. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Uh, my name is Coach James. I'm from Chicago. Um, when I say I'm like, I'm like super nervous right now. You're like one of the greatest guys I've ever met. And being this close to you is like an honor to me. Um, I grew up in Chicago. I never got the opportunity to play football as a youth. There wasn't no programs there. We was broke. Um, no father, no, you know, all, all the, the things you would say of why we couldn't. But, you know, when I, I watched, literally, my first year watching football, was in 85 when you guys were doing your thing. Matter of fact, I didn't even know you were winning to game six. So um, I got one question, and it's been on my mind since 85. Uh, I've been coaching like for 20 years, but I, I always wanted to know what it was like, literally, that minute, that, that last minute of that game when y'all beat the Patriots. I just want to know what was going through your mind that last minute before the clock buzzed and you became an NFL champion. What was on my mind? <laughs> there were a couple of things. The year before, when we lost to the uh, San Francisco 49ers in the championship game, I was standing on the bench talking to the fans. There was about uh, five seconds left in the game, and I was standing on the bench with tears in my eyes. We lost the game 26 nothing, And I was telling the fans, we will be back next year. We will be back. We got on the plane, and immediately I was going through the plane talking about we are going to the Super Bowl next year. It is going to be the Bears next year, not anybody else. It's going to be our year. And everything we do from the time we get off of this plane until the time that we're in the Super Bowl next year, we are going to talk about nothing but the Super Bowl. Nothing's going to be important but the Super Bowl. That's all we're going to talk about. By the time we landed, all the guys were up and around, and we were excited. We had put in the vision. The vision was in place for what we were going to do that next year. And we started, when we got off the plane, we started getting together. We started getting together in the off season. We started uh, checking up on each other. Hey, man, are you, what, what, how are your workouts going? What's going on? What, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing this. Well, you know what? Do more of this. Um, so we talked about it all through the off season. We got into the season and uh, started off kind of slow and the momentum got going. We did the Super Bowl shuffle about week uh, 10, the same weekend that we lost to uh, that Monday night when we lost to the Miami Dolphins, we came back that next day and made the Super Bowl shuffle. It was probably the best thing that happened because it got us all in a great mood. We were excited. We got the game behind us. Let's go. Now we had the Super Bowl shuffle. We are the shuffling crew, shuffling for you. You know, we're, we're going to go all the way. The Super Bowl shuffle, they started playing it before the season was over. So the pressure was on us. We, we got to go now. We're going to look like the biggest dummies ever. You'll be playing this for years. So, um, so the pressure was on us now, even more so, uh, to make sure that we do go to the Super Bowl. But it, it was such a fun year, and when that clock ended, all my mind could do was think about the first day that Coach Dicker came to the Bears. He came three years earlier. And what he said that first day, I can still see him and I can still hear the speech. He came in, Coach Dicker had orange, red hair. He had been drinking a little bit, celebrating it. He got the job. He came in and he was kind of looking at us kind of sideways. And uh, finally he said, man, I want you to understand something. My name's Coach Ditka. I know some of you don't know me, some of you don't like me, that's okay. But I want to tell you, in three years, in three years, 
we are going to go to the Super Bowl. In three years, some of you will not be here. That's okay. But in three years, do you hear me? Three years, we are going to the Super Bowl. That's what I thought about. At that moment, <clears throat> it clicked. That's what he said. And that's what happened. Hey, Coach. My name is Sean Dennis, coach um, <clears throat> from Los Angeles, California, Crenshaw High School. I just wanted to get your ideas and thoughts on promoting work ethic for the average inner city high school football player. Wow. Um, you know, I, I think, I think when you begin to talk about uh, promoting a work ethic or whatever, I, I, I always think that it starts at the top as a coach. And then you got to find those leaders on the team. Um, sometimes you got to point them out and let them know that they're leaders. Some guys don't know that they're leaders. And you point them out and say, hey, I need to talk to you, son. You know, you, you have something about you. There is something that's very special about you. I want to see you do this. When we're in practice, you know, try to, try to do this. Or whatever. And, and just find those guys. Most of them, if they're not already doing it, they're not going to talk because guys won't listen to them because it's not natural. You got a natural leader, fantastic. I mean, that's great. But it's hard to find them these days. So, uh, but if you just point out guys that, that have that work ethic, that other guys can just catch that enthusiasm, catch that vision, and you yourself do it. And, and when you see things that, that are not, that are below par, that are below, I, I wouldn't settle for it. Some guys are scared to say anything because you may lose kids. I'd rather lose them than keep them and have them take my whole team down. I, I want to set a standard and say, this is the standard of this team. Now, if I got 10 kids, well, okay, I got 10 kids. But those 10 kids, we're going to go out and we're going to do the best that we can. We're going to lose together? Okay, fine. But I want to make sure that we have the kids and they understand that this is the standard that we're going to play with and make sure that they live up to it and the coaches and, and they hold each other together. When I think about the 85 Bears, uh, just on a side note, and it could happen at any level, I believe. One of the things that was really special about that team is that we had a group of guys. Uh, people want to say that we were great athletes. I know I was not great as an athlete. I know Dan Hampton was not great as an athlete. Dan could not run from here to there to the end of this hall. He could not do that. Steve McMichael could not run from here to that wall. Dent, maybe. So we were not great. Gary, Gary Fensick ran about this fast. <laughs> but let me tell you about Gary, uh, Gary Fensick. Gary Fensick would look at that point, he would look at this point, and he would look at that point. And before he knew where the ball was going before the ball got snapped, and he started. <laughs> By the time the quarterback got through it, he was right there. <laughs> it's amazing. He knew it. The thing that was great about that team, I've never seen anything like it. And sometimes when you're in something, you don't know how special it is. But we had guys that hated to lose. We had guys that hated to lose. And we had guys that would confront you. This is the thing that guys don't do today. But if I missed a tackle, if a guy got three yards on a run, Dan Hampton would turn around to me and say, hey, shorty, you got to make that tackle. You got to make that play. And if the quarterback through a pass over 10 yards, I'm in his face. Hey, where's the pass rush? Come on, man, we got to go, let's go. And, and that's what we did, we pushed each other. And I didn't want to be the one. So I'm gonna try to make the tackle in the backfield every time, because I don't want to hear Dan. And now, here's another story. Dan Hampton and Mike Singletary did not get along when we were playing. When I was there, Dan got on my nerves all the time. He would always say, hey, Shorty, I'm the reason that you're making these plays. I'm the reason. Dan. And then Steve McMichael would chime in and say, yeah, Shorty, what you got to say about that? Said, you know what? I don't like either one of you guys. <laughs> but let me tell you what happened. <laughs> 
Nobody could have told me that I wasn't good when I played. No, no, no. Nobody could not tell me that I was great. I wasn't going to say it, but I felt I was great. When I walked on the field, you could tell I thought I was great. Thing. When Dan retired, all of a sudden, I got slow. All of a sudden, I couldn't beat these blocks. I mean, every time I turn around, there are two and three guys around me. I'm like, wait a minute, what, what's, what's happening here? I had no idea how important the defensive line was. I had no idea how important those four guys in front of me, I had no idea how great they were and how they protected me, I had no idea. So when I got the call that I made to Hall of Fame, guess who was the first guy that I called? I sat there, I sat back in my chair after crying and everything else, and I thought, which teammate am I gonna call? And I had to think about who pushed me the most. I called Dan. I said, Dan, <laughs> you are the first guy, the first teammate that I'm calling before any other teammate just to tell you how much I appreciate you. The love and respect that I have for you, I thank you. I thank you. That's the kind of team that we had. That's the kind of love that we had for one another. And that's the kind of drive that we had. One time we were sitting in, uh, I had uh, asked Coach Dicker to come. This was uh, maybe 10 years ago. I asked Coach Dicker to come and, and uh, got the guys together. And we were all there. And we were talking about some of the fears that we had in life as a team. And one of the guys said, you know, I fear that it's never going to be any better. I I'm never going to see anything in my life like how I felt being a part of that team. What I felt was unlike anything else in life. And I'm afraid that I'll never, ever feel that again. And I thought about that, and it really made us all sit back and think for a minute, because it is amazing when you make a decision to do something great and play at a level that really has, has not been played at before, where you set the bar at excellence and push yourself to get there. It's rare, very rare. Thanks, Mike for uh, coming out and talking today. Uh, reflecting back as a player and or a coach, what is the number one thing that you would define that you would do differently? The number one thing that I would do different as a player and a coach? You are. <clears throat> I think as a, as a player, the number one thing that I wish I would have done differently, I wish I w would have worked on my hands more. Uh, because I was so small and, you know, not a blazing, fast guy, I, I was all about being precise about where I needed to be and precise about my, my entry points. Um, there were some interceptions that I could have made that could have changed the game. A couple of them I know for sure. And, and I think about this in life is sometimes, you know, as a coach, I'll see a player that he's out there working on things that he's really good at, but it takes courage. It takes courage to work on things that you're not good at. To me, that's what true greatness is all about. So. I, figured, I, I felt like I had so many other things that I needed to work on that, that I really should have focused on my hands more. Um, if I had done that, I, I don't know how much better I could have been. I, I think I could have been a whole lot better uh, because there were at least 
seven or eight balls that I could have caught and maybe took them back to the house when we were in tough games and, and I didn't. I dropped them. Uh, they just hit my hands and I was a good cover guy but just couldn't, couldn't close it. That's one thing. As a, as a coach, as a coach, one of the things that I realized for, <laughs> for all of the African-American coaches in this room, for every African-American coach, the one thing that I, I didn't realize, and it took me a while after leaving San Francisco, as an African-American coach, when, when you're riding these guys and when you're on their tails, nine times out of 10, you're talking to a kid that his dad abandoned him. Nine times out of 10, you're talking to a kid that don't trust you. Nine times out of 10, you're talking to a kid that someone that looked like you abused that kid. And so it is so important, it is so important that you find a way to have this kid know that you love him. First and foremost, gain his trust before you begin to get on his tail. That's one thing that I learned. I, I learned that I was a bad guy even before coaching him. So I had to do a little bit more work to earn his trust. It's an amazing thing to think about that, but it's true. That's the reality. It is. So I have yes, sir, Mr. Singleton, over here to your left. Other. <laughs> Over here, sir. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, another Chicago fan. I was going to ask you um, about the NFL Man of the Year Award and uh, Walter Payton and what he meant to you and what that award means to you. What did it mean, the honor or Walter Payton? What did the award mean and why did they name it after him? When I got drafted, um, to Chicago, one of my mentors said, Mike, I don't know much about Chicago. Just a couple of things I know about Chicago. I know it's cold, and I know there's a guy, in there, a guy there by the name of Sweetness, and he is special. You got to understand, when I left college, you know, all through high school, my coaches said, Mike, you want to play some fullback? No, I don't want anything to do with fullback. I, I, all I want to do is hit the guy with the ball. I, you know, some in my mind just did not, I, I could not, I felt like a traitor if I went on the other side of the ball and carried the ball, then I come back over here and I hit the guy. I, I just couldn't get it in my mind. So, I, no, I can't do it. So I didn't really have respect for running backs. Um, you know, all through college, I, I, just, wanted to, I just wanted to hit a running back. That, that's what I wanted to do. But when I got to Chicago and I saw this guy that they call Sweetness, and his legs went above his head when he was running the ball. And he would stop on a dime and his legs would go up like that and come down and he's going that way. I was like, whoa. I mean, I started playing defense as best I could so I could go on the sideline and watch this guy run. And he was a guy, he was not soft. There are DBs I know that did not want to hit him, linebackers too. And you came up to hit him, Man, you gotta have your lunch now. You gotta have your lunch with you because he's gonna, he's, gonna, he's gonna take you down. So I gained so much respect for him. And off the field, off the field, you gotta watch him now. He's a prankster. There's no telling what he might do. I was always, my head was always on the swivel. Where's Walter? When it got quiet, I started looking for Walter. As a person, if you wanna have fun, if you want to have fun as a person, man, you want to be around Walter. This joker was funny. It was fun. If you were down, he'd pick you up. Hey, Mikey, man, what you, what you, what you, what you found for? Come on, man, what you, look at your shoes, man. Look at your pants falling down. I mean, he would just have you laughing and be so excited about life. He was full of life, and he would do anything. He would go out of his way. 
He would take a football to a kid. He found out a kid was sick. He would get in his car, sign, go sign, have the whole team sign an autograph on football and go take it to the kid. Go take it to a parent. Give money to a, to a home. I mean, he was a, a, a guy that was an example for all of us. Um, so, needless to say, uh, Walter Payton as a football player was absolutely tremendous. But as a man, as a mentor, supersedes anything. Mike, over here. If, over here, Mike. If you had to pick one of the most important things in your life, which one out of graduating high school, graduating college, winning the Super Bowl, or being in the Hall of Fame, and why? Which one is the most important in your life? I would say the greatest thing that I ever did as an athlete was to get my degree. And the reason why is because I was the first in my family. I was told when I went to Baylor that I wouldn't graduate. Um, and there were so many behind me at my high school. I was the first at my high school to get a scholarship to a major college. So all eyes were on me in my neighborhood, in my high school. Uh, being able to go to Baylor and go through the stuff. I mean, there were many nights that I looked out the window with tears in my eyes. I'm staying up to 2 and 3 in the morning every night trying to make it, and at the same time, competing off the field, trying to be the best, working before practice, working after practice. You know, you just, it was like one thing running into the other. But when I got my degree and I saw <laughs> the tears in my mom's eyes, the tears in my dad's eyes, the pride that they felt, there was nothing like that. That was nothing like that. that. That was one of the happiest days of my life as an athlete. Last question. On behalf of my wife, Mike, I want to thank you for mentioning the women. 46 years we've been together, 46 football seasons. Things have changed. The coaches here are dealing with parents that want access to us 24-7. How would you handle that? You know, I, as a coach, I don't think you can. I, don't, I think it's a systematic thing. I think that um, the NCAA, uh, high school, whatever it is, at some point in time, at some point in time, we are really going to have to look at the system that we have in place, not just for our kids, not for our student athletes, but for our kids, period. Um, it's gonna have to change. Because if it continues to go the way it is, then you know, we're going to continue to develop the, the outer portion of the kid, and the inside of the kid is going to be developed by the phone. And, and um, that's going to be a sad thing. Um, then all hell is going to break loose. So I, um, I, I don't think there's a thing you can do. Maybe the head coach of, uh, of a team or something like that can make decisions and say, we're going to do this. But it's, if everybody else is doing the same thing, to some degree, you have to say, well, where's the line? Because you have to compete. So I'd love to stand here and say, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd throw those phones. I'd love to say that. But it's not going to work. So until the system understand the, the people that make those decisions, and that's a sad thing, they're, they're not going to do it. Um, it's going to have to change some way. But in order to have a life and in order to, to have these kids really begin to build themselves from the inside out and you guys to have family, some kind of family life, um, I don't know. That, that's a tough one. Well, I can't tell you um, I don't do this enough, but uh, I am so grateful to have the opportunity to have the chance to speak with you. 
And I, I can't tell you how much respect that I have for you because you're in the trenches. I don't care what we do at the professional level. I don't care what we do at the college, the collegiate level. If you fail, we can fail. We, we can fail at the collegiate level. We can fail at the professional level. But if you fail, got no chance. We got no chance. None. Thank you. No.